second webinar of 2022. Uh, this webinar today is about drying power transformers and the effects of moisture in power transformers. Uh, as you can see, we are actually doing this live. So this is our first time doing it live, and uh, we are excited about that. Uh, I'm not going to be in the picture that much, so I'm gonna, we're going to switch the cameras in just a minute. So having said that, uh, once again, welcome everyone to our second webinar, and I'm going to get started. As we always do, I, I want to start with uh, our safety moment. And I chose the topic ladder safety uh, because I changed the light bulb this weekend. And I thought about ladder safety purposely. But uh, joke aside, uh, we need to use the correct ladder for the job, inspect the ladder before each use. And only one person should climb it at a time. And when climbing down a ladder, please look before stepping down because uh, of any type of uh, uh, safety footing and things might have changed, use the correct angle, and please mark defective letters. This doesn't apply just to our businesses, but even at our homes. Safety is everywhere with us. And if, if, if any letter doesn't look safe, just, just get rid of them and buy a new one. I'm actually going to start my presentation today once again, for those of you who might have attended my webinars before, I, I use this slide quite often. Why? Because cellulosic material, paper, wood, is one of the main insulations that we use in the transformers. Of course, we're talking about liquid field transformers today, not dry tar transformers. And talking about moisture and drying, what we are trying to dry in transformers is the cellulosic material. So before we start getting into drying them, before we start getting into the effects of moisture, I want to point out this, the cellulose fiber chain. What I really want to show everyone here is, I'm not a chemical engineer, so all these C's and H's, and it, one thing that I really want to point out is this right here. H2O, water. So the cellulose fiber chain, the major groups of the fiber chain is connected by water. And that's when we say transformers aging or transformers releasing water, or even when we say we have to dry this transformer. But as we speak about drying the transformers, are we breaking the bond or not? And that's what we're going to get into today. But I did want to start speaking about this. Another thing that for those of you who might not have seen how uh, a typical coil looks like in a transformer, I have a picture here of a, a very simple disc winding transformer where you see that around the conductor we have special paper high uh, temperature graded paper, we have cellulosic material key spacers, we have cellulosic material cylinders, and that's just the winding. And towards the end of this presentation, you're gonna, wait, I'm gonna show you what other areas, structures of the transformer that has cellulosic material. That is what we're gonna focus today. When we talk about wet transformers and how everything incorporates with oil is the topic. At this moment, I'm gonna have to assume that everybody can hear me. If you cannot hear me, put, put it in your chat line. But before we keep going here, I do want to uh, make a couple remarks. Uh, I'm sure you're gonna have questions during. Uh, in order to keep the time, to respect everybody's time, we have time limits, of course, please start writing your questions in the chat box and we will have time to answer and have a Q&A session at the end of this uh, webinar. In addition to that, as you have seen in our invitation, in our webinar invitation, that those of you who are interested will be able to get continuous education credits. Uh, however, to, to, to receive that, we will share an email address with you at the end of this webinar, and please email to that email address, and we will send you the necessary certifications and documentations for you to get your CUEs. 
The last remark that I want to make is, uh, as I get to the end of this seminar, before we get into the Q&A, we're going to actually have a poll, a very simple poll, just one click for you. Please, if you could answer that, that's just going to make us get better and better with these webinars to serve you, our customers, better. So, talking about moisture and liquid fuel transformers, I'm going to talk about moisture in oil. And, and it will be clear why I want to start talking about moisture in oil. The amount of water in oil is normally determined with a single uh, simple test. Water affects the oil properties in the following matters. It reduces the oil dielectric strength. Risk of oversaturation if the transformer is cooled rapidly. And there's some really nice pictures coming up, uh, some experimental pictures that I'll share with you. Combined with oxygen, it creates oxidation and accelerates the aging of the transformer. And of course, failure risk due to bubbling at high temperatures. And we'll discuss all these coming up. Oil saturation. So what is the source of water in a transformer? Of course, you can always have external oil, uh, water, right? But if we just think about a perfectly sealed, assembled transformer, where could the water come from? From the insulation itself. We dry the insulation, of course. As we dry the insulation, we bring the uh, water content in any insulation less than 0.5%. And just hold that thought here, and we're going to come back. So as the water dissolves in oil, even though water and oil do not mix, but there is a saturation ratio that we need to talk about. Because for you, the end users, to be able to see the amount of water in your insulation, you're not going to be able to go and take a piece of insulation out of your transformer. What you deal with is oil. Okay? So I wanted to talk here first, start talking about the oil saturation and the oil first. Then we're going to get into insulation. And then we will talk about the drying methods. Because I wanted to get the attention here, even though we call this webinar drying transformers, that's easy. Yeah, there are so many methods. Here are the equipment that's how you dry it. But I want to be able to talk about why we dry it. Why is it so critical to have dry transformers? What does it do? How does it do? And so on and so forth. So the water content in oil can be expressed in PPM per parts per million. This value must be related to the oil saturation characteristics. But this characteristics varies with the type of oil and the condition. And it's more useful to consider the relative saturation of oil when evaluating this common saturation. So going into this topic, more water is dissolved in oil at high temperatures. So the next slide, you will see a picture. And in this curve right here, you can actually see the relation of the oil saturation. The y-axis is water content at saturation and the temperature. So you can see here, let's take 80 degrees C the water content at saturation levels compared to just go to 40 degrees is almost three times. When a wet transformer is allowed to cool down rapidly, the oil may become oversaturated and water will precipitate. At high temperatures, the water migrates from paper into oil. At low temperatures, water tends to be absorbed by paper but it's much slower process. And I do have a table coming up uh, that, that actually the data shows the, the difference between oil migrating from paper into oil as the temperature of the transformer increases. I'm sure most of us know why the temperature increases because as the transformer is operating in the field, you have losses in the core due to flux. The core gets hot. And of course, most importantly, the windings due to I square R is the current flows through the windings. So the transformers are designed to run at 65 degree rise. 
oil saturation. The relative saturation, RH, is the moisture content relative to the saturation value given at a given temperature. At equilibrium, so when the oil saturation is achieved, the relative saturation in oil is equal to the relative saturation in paper. It varies within the transformer, and of course, it is dependent on the temperature, as always. So let's take a second here and think about this again. The water migration and the oil saturation with the moisture is depending on the temperature. Okay, so having said that, even though I'll probably talk about this again coming up in the next several slides, but please keep this in mind now. If you take an oil sample to test for moisture level of your transformer, and it's a cool day, your transformer is only loaded 20%, 25%, so it's really just, say, maybe 10 degrees hotter than the ambient temperature, the moisture content you will measure, you'll get it measured, will be different than in a hot summer day, your transformer is fully loaded and you take a sample. The transformer was not exposed, it was perfectly sealed, but then your moisture levels from that sample to this sample will be different. Of course, the sample you have taken as long as you have taken the sample correctly and not exposed the sample itself, the higher temperature sample will show more moisture. Because as the transformer cools down, that moisture migrates back into the cellulosic material. Okay? And here is the picture of the oil saturation at different uh, ratios. Less than 100. Of course, there is no saturation. As you get higher than 100%, then you can see how oil is being saturated with the moisture itself. So the clarity of the oil changes. Now, we talked about oil. Why did I talk about oil first? As I said before, is because oil is like the blood of the transformer where you can test it for a lot of things, just like the DGA webinar we had last month. And to test your moisture content, you rely on your oil test results, okay? So now let's talk about moisture and insulation. The amount of water in paper insulation directly affects the following. Aging rate of the winding insulation, oil bubbling temperature, limiting loading capability of a transformer. And most importantly, the dielectric resistance of the insulation structure of the transformer. I mean, I think it, it's, it's elementary school knowledge here saying that electricity and water, they just cannot go together. That's pretty much the main reason why we are having this. But not only from a dielectric perspective, but from aging perspective. Just like us, we are an organic structure. Just like the cellulosic material, we use the papers, the woods, that was, that is an organic structure. As you saw in the very first slide, that is bonded together with water. So moisture is in your transformers. As long as you have cellulosic material, you have moisture. But it's our job to control that moisture and give you guys a transformer that lasts minimum 60 years. Guideline of moisture in oil. The moisture increases as transformers age. How? If, you, if any one of you are sitting there and saying, how does the moisture increase if I have it perfectly sealed, either nitrogen blanket or conservator tank, whatever, the breathers and all that, because of the, that less than 0.5% moisture that is left in your insulation? As your transformers run for years and years, life is good, it will release some moisture, it will age. It's a natural phenomena, it will happen. And this aging due to largely to the normal degradation process of the paper insulation. What are the limits? Anything between zero to 2% of water is considered to be an okay dry transformer. Between two to 4% is considered to be a wet transformer and anything about 4% is, is really wet transformer. So, let's talk about 
continue to talking about cellulosic material. As of now, I think it's very clear that the majority of the insulation, other than the oil, okay, is paper, wood. So there is a test called degree of polymerization. And this is for cellulosic paper. And it works as counting the average number of anthrose B glucose monomer. I think I said it okay with my accent here in the cellulose molecules. So I'm going to zoom here. This is a microscopic view of paper. And this right here is this right here is a new paper under a heavy microscope where you can see the bonds of the fiber chain. This is the fiber chain. That's the paper. Now, when we go to an aged paper, you can see how the fiber chain has broken. Remember the very first slide. Now it's coming together why I showed that very first slide first. What was holding all this fiber chain together was water. H2O. And so this is an aged fiber under microscope. So this paper has aged. And this doesn't have to be a paper just in your transformer. You can simply just take a piece of paper, put it in your oven. Don't try this at home and have a fire, please. But you, it's cellulosic material. It will get brittle and it will age very quickly at very hot temperatures. So if we go back to degree of polarization, this is the example of how the colors look different. Now, one thing I want to show here is it says DP952, 549, 181. This sample they couldn't define, and then 104. So as the paper ages, the color changes because the fiber chain is being broken. And these are actually the expected life in years of that cellulosic material. That's how the DP degree of polymerization test results come. So now some of you, I'm sure, asking this question. How am I going to get a DP sample from my transformer? You're not. Please don't go inside your transformer during, say, uh, five-year maintenance or whatever and try to remove an insulation sample. Every insulation we put in your transformers has a reason, and it has to be that. However, if you're truly, truly interested, I have had customers where they ask us to put additional little blocks or key spacers on top of the coils uh, and secure them, of course, for them to remove it later, just for this purpose. However, this is exactly why I started the webinar talking about oil first. And the next slides, we're going to connect how you can estimate the water content in paper by oil testing. Now, this transformer right here, a coil here, is where you can see the results of overaging and how the insulation looks like. Okay. And here, moisture in paper. Direct measurements of water content in the cellulosic insulation within the transformer is typically not available, as I said before. But equilibrium curves, like the ones you're seeing here on the right side, are used to drive this from oil readings. Various factors, though, influence this relationship, including the temperature of oil paper interface, thickness of the paper, integration over long periods as needed. So if I look at this chart here, I have paper, absolute humidity, percent and relative humidity RH of oil and the relationship of that from zero degrees to hundred degrees. So if we just take a if we just take a line say from 60 degrees and you can see in respect to the relative humidity of oil at different temperatures how the values are changing. Okay. Now this one here. 
Remember what we said earlier. As the transformer heats up, the insulation gets hot from the heat being dissipated from your conductors, your core, and even metal parts get hot. The moisture gets released and migrates into the oil. And that is a fast process. And you will see the pictures of the experiments coming out. As the transformer starts cooling down, that moisture starts migrating back into the paper, which is why this here is oil to paper diffusion rate. So if we take one millimeter, two millimeter, or four millimeter, as an example, what's the two millimeter insulation? Well, one of the, well, everything in transform is critical, but if you think about a disc winding, two millimeter key spacers to keep the disc separated for dielectrics, for thermal, and for mechanical reasons, it's commonly used two millimeter or three or even four or six, depending on the calculations. And why am I talking about key spacer? Because key spacers, especially two thirds of the height of the winding, so the key spaces close to the top of the winding are actually considered from an insulation material point of view to be at the hardest point, which is why when we get customer requests, requirements to put fiber optics in the transformers, that's the area that we actually inject or insert the fiber optic props to. So your key spacers at that height is at one of the hardest spots in the transformer. So if you think about your disc winding transformer that has two millimeter key spacers, so if you look at the oil to paper, so oil to paper, what's migrating is the moisture. We're talking about moisture today. So for a two millimeter at 100 degrees, this is in days, it takes almost four days. But at 20 degrees, the same so if your transformer is running cool, it's going to take up to 300 days for that moisture to migrate back into your insulation. This is right here. This slide will show you the pictures of an experiment that was done several years ago, where we will look at residual water in winding insulation and how the water releases water vapor and how it creates bubbles at high temperatures. For that, an experimental coil was done. You can see here, this is a typical disc winding. And with this experiment, this was put under mineral oil and current was circulating to get the conductor hot. And as you can see, this conductor is paper wrapped, just a typical winding conductor that we use. And here are your key spacers that you can see. So within this experiment, there it is. As we start to heat the windings, what you're seeing here is the bubbles, bubble formation. So imagine your transformer is cool and you energize it and you really start loading it up to 70, 80% of the load. And the, the very rapid increase of the temperature within the conductor, the water vapor is going to have to get out. It's going to release itself. So we are not just talking about moisture risk but we are also talking about micro bubbling risk, which is what you're seeing. So this is a true effect. Actually, I have seen uh, during some of the test failure investigations before where we have a lighting impulse failure, disk to disk. We drain it, we look at it and we see it hard. Well, we cannot really, why did it arc that? This is a learning many, many years ago about the bubbling, this water vapor bubbling case where what we figured out is that we had done a temperature rise test on this unit and we had immediately gone up to uh, 
the maximum load and on that unit this is many years ago and the fans were not turned on so the unit got so hot and this water vapors here it actually created blisters on the insulation because when we start looking at uh, this failure and trying to understand why it failed we could literally see in this paper small tiny white uh, points so what happens with that is that you lose the dielectric integrity of that design even with this case so you may say okay, okay that's 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 gonna go away well it's gonna it may go away but you saw a slide before the migration back in the paper takes sometimes days so you have a brittle insulation in this case And here, I'm going to actually zoom to this one. You can see these water vapors being released from the paper. Why? Because that paper, yes, we dried it. Maybe it was a little wet. I mean, this was for experimental purposes. Maybe we didn't bring it down to less than 0.5%. But it is mainly to show you all how the water vapor is being released when the transformer is getting hot. Now, in our test areas, if this happens, the transformer, say that we are doing a temperature rise test, we only really have impedance voltage and really on one of the windings, there's really no voltage. So the dielectric stress is nothing. But imagine in the field, your unit, your transformer is fully loaded and during that fully loaded if this phenomenon occurs and lightning happens or switching happens then you have a transformer with water vapor streaming between the discs and everything and then you got you got a lightning effect uh, event or a switching event what will happen it will fail the transformer will fail because of that we have this webinar today even though we called it drying of transformers but once again I, I'd rather talk about why we have to dry transformers first and then get into half. How is easy? Okay, overheating. Trap bubbles. Here's another example. Right here, where the bubbles, once again, from overheating and due to moisture being released from the insulation the bubbles are trapped underneath the disc imagine this disc winding where you have discs you have pancakes like we also say sometimes so the insulation is wrapped all 360 degrees around the conductor so the moisture is going to release from top and the moisture is going to release from bottom and here once again the bubble emission from insulation into your oil which is another reason why I started the webinar talking about oil saturation first, not paper. And what happens if we test the wet transformer or if we, if accidentally in the field, the transformer is wet and it goes through transients, it sees some transient stresses. This is what happens. This is a very typical, we call it the tree branches of a dielectric failure on insulation. It could be a winding cylinder. It could be a face-to-face -face barrier. But this is basically where the energy arcs on the insulation and it actually creates this type of tree branches. Actually, for those of you who have been involved with test failure analysis, and who are really good uh, there's actually ways to look at the direction of these trees and understand try to understand which nod to which nod the electricity actually arced especially if you're if you think about you're doing a lighting impulse test on a transform on a mere, uh, liquid fuel transformer for those of you who've seen that waveform we are actually discharging negative energy so the ground is actually is a positive energy compared to the impulse energy that we are releasing. 
So a lot of people say when we are investigating test failures, lighting impulse failures, they always tend to say it's okay because you're releasing energy, right? They say impulse arced from here to, to the core clamp. Not necessarily. Impulse can, the energy equilibrium, it can actually arc from the core clamp into your winding as well. Because of that, if you're dealing with this type of energy release, for those of you who may be part of investigation of a test failure, it is important to know the direction of these tree branches and also even look at the point of impact and then look at the direction of the blowout because that also helps you where which direction it went first. But nonetheless, coming back, this is the result of a dielectric failure. This is the dielectric failure of a result of a wet paper, a transformer that has not been dried properly. And then this right here is where an insulation pretty much overcooked over time. Just like I said earlier, it's like me cooking turkey during Thanksgiving. Okay? And I'm sure most of you know that uh, vacation movie where they, they sit down for the Thanksgiving dinner and the turkey is really over dried. So that's what happens even to the insulation around the conductor. If, we, if you run your transformers hot, 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 the insulation will age very, very quickly because why the water will dissipate. Here's another example of an electric field around HV winding. So before H around HV winding, I actually put a picture of one of our transformers here, just to show you all the amount of insulation is used. And after this slide, I'll actually share another slide with you to show the amount of insulation compared to the amount of oil is, is nothing. But here is a typical liquid fuel transformer. Obviously, this is an LTC transformer with low tap changer. Every lead has to be insulated. The wood structure, of course, those are not just wood. Those are very special, specialized, high electric grade wood, TX or L1s or L2s. And then you have on this design, not every design has to have it, but on this design, you have other wraps of the high voltage winding. So you cannot see those discs. But what you're seeing here, these other wraps serve really two purposes, not just for dielectric reasons, but also for cooling. It creates a chimney effect for the oil to travel, uh, flow through the windings properly and cool the windings down as well. But as you can see here, and a lot of the times where you may not see it in this picture, but where we have uh, uh, core clamps or the jack pass close to windings or the winding pressure rings or winding tables, we even insulate them with special insulation material, which is all cellulosic material. So pretty much everything electrical connection or connections to help electrical connections is cellulosic. It doesn't have to be cellulosic. Yes, fiberglass is used. Uh, FRP boards are used, there are others, but why cellulose? Why is it so common? Why can't we just use plastic? Some of you, I'm sure you know this answer, but because cellulose actually soaks oil in. So paper or wood soaked in with oil, the dielectric integrity increases by th three times. If you just use, you know, there are other materials, you know, there are high temperature grade uh, plastics that we could literally use in transformers if you want to, but their dielectric strength compared to oil soaked insulation like this is a lot less. That's why even 200 years, 300 years after we first invented the transformer, we have to still use paper and wood in our transformers because of that phenomena mainly. But you can see how much cellulosic material is used. So imagine, imagine a large, this looks to me uh, almost like a 200 MVA unit. So the amount of insulation in this 
uh, in this transformer, let's just make a number is probably close to one ton. Okay? So, and you know, I said so, because we are going to dry these transformers and give you all your insulation, all your insulation. Not just the key spacers, not just the leads, but everything, everything that you see here must be dried properly. What you don't see here is you have more coils, more windings on the inside that you cannot see. And all those windings have key spacers, blocks, paper wrapping. Doesn't have to be sometimes we use netted CTC also, but a lot of times we use CTC with paper wrapping around it. So we have to get heat in there. We have to do things. Now we're going to get into the drying shortly. We have to be able to get, remove the moisture out of every insulation that you're seeing here. And we're going to start speaking about that coming up soon. Now, what did I say less than a minute ago? We have all this insulation, but most of the moisture is in the paper. So if you think about, say, that 200 uh, MVA transformer probably has around, say, 20,000 gallons of oil. Oil is your insulator. And oil is your coolant also. So 20,000 gallons of oil and one ton of cellulosic material. So insulation weight distribution, meaning 90% on a typical medium to large power transformer, 90% of your total weight of insulation is in your oil. And only 10% is in your, in your cellulosic material. Most of them are the thick, like the pressure rings, winding tables, the blocks. And then you get into thinner ones, like the key spacers, uh, phase barriers. And then you have the winding, which are like the paper wrapping around the turns and stuff like that. But most of your moisture is within this one, which is also distributed, as you see here. So then, <clears throat> if you have, say, 2% moisture, 2% moisture of the oil analysis that you did, the distribution is all in your insulation material. Now, we're going to start talking about the drying techniques. Uh, we are doing okay with the time. Everybody's doing okay. Okay. So, I listed here almost all drying techniques that are used in the industry. I am not going to say this is good, this is bad. That's not my job. But these are the techniques that are used. Of course, the last one is the best one that we're going to talk about. Most of you probably know. But of course, depending on the size, the application of the transformer, it may be okay to use some of these. It may not be okay. Justification is up to you. At the end, what you're really asking for is, do you have, how can you prove to me that you are getting the insulation moisture content less than 0.5%. So the hot air one. The hot air with a maximum temperature at 120 degrees, and then the maximum insulation temperature of 150 degrees. So provided that the transformer tank is vacuum tight, the drying process can be optimized by evacuating the transformer. The drawback of this process is that the active parts are non-uniformly heated. So this is really not any different than a big oven where you circulate hot air and uh, you keep it in there for a certain amount of time. And the time changes depend on the amount of insulation that you're going to dry. And a lot of companies who may be using this, they also not only the amount all the insulation, but they also go with the structure, the winding structures that they have. If, if it's got two winding, if it's got three winding, and so on and so forth, and they define, they say, okay, we're going to put this unit in the oven for three days, two days, 10 hours, 12 hours, whatever it is. Vacuum oven drying, it's very similar to hot air, but in this one, the vessel itself, where you put your uh, active part in, actually has vacuum. Why is vacuum important during dry, drying of transformers? 
we'll talk about that when we talk about what happens after vapor phase or after drying, right? You have to vacuum because water vaporizes at zero atmospheric pressure without a need of any heat. So when you have an oven that also have a vacuum inside, then you will be able to dry your insulation more uniformly, okay? All the circulation. This is a practice that may be used more in the field where you really don't have ovens and vacuum chambers and so on and so forth. Uh, this is used by having special equipments where it has a degassing unit, it has heaters, it circulates, it gets the temperature at, uh, up to 180 uh, degrees C and continuously gets the oil hot and circulate. It sucks it in, pumps it, and it may take, I actually was part of a drying process of a large unit before years ago, uh, and the unit was wet, and it was not, uh, from, from a schedule point of view, it was more important to actually try to dry the transformer in the field than trying to ship it back to the uh, plant. Uh, so we did. And it took us around close to 40 days of hot oil circulation to, to, to dry the transformer. But this is the old method of just relying on your heaters and de degasification. Uh, it's not commonly used in the plants. Only time the plants we may be doing this is after regular vapor phase or whatever drying that we do. And then we tank and then say that the tanking time takes a little longer. And we, we may be dealing with it, we may be concerned a little bit with uh, surface moisture, then we can do this process just to get that uh, surface moisture out. <clears throat> oil spray, I actually do have a picture of this uh, from one of our plants. Uh, it's also really used for uh, surface moisture removal. We use it uh, mostly when, uh, after we dry the core and coil, we tank it, and we say, okay, our limit, time limit of exposure. What is exposure? Well, exposure is this. Whichever methods we use, we dry the transformer, we dry the insulation. Now you have really, really dry, say, paper. Yes, our factories are air conditioned, humidity control, but not all factories are humidity control. So you have moisture in the air. So this dry, nicely dried paper if it's not oil soaked, it's so ready to suck all the moisture back inside. That's why we had to really hurry up in our manufacturing, put this unit in the tank, weld the cover, bolt the cover, whatever people do, and then put it under vacuum. So in our large uh, transformer manufacturing plant, we actually have the oil spray in case if we have to, or anything uh, about 230 kV, we do the hot oil spray. The way it's done is basically you have spray nozzles assembled on the manholes and special uh, entrance points. And then we get the vacuum in, we spray hot oil, and then suck it in and circulate it and try to get all that surface moisture out. One of the best ones, the most advanced ones is called a vapor phase drying, VPD. Okay, how does it work? BPD process has actually different processes built into, which is controlled by PLC. It actually, I'm going to go to this one first and show you a picture of the vessel, the picture of the vessel that the core and coil goes in, the door shuts down, and then we start the process. The first thing the vapor phase does is starts the vacuum process. It starts getting all the oxygen and bringing the atmospheric pressure down. No heating yet. Now you have, that's why those vessels, those big tanks have to be very strong to withstand this strong vacuum. Then it doesn't just rely on heating. Remember two, three slides before, there was another method which is vacuum hot air. In that case, it was just a vacuum and hot air. In this case, the vapor phase drying applies the vacuum and then it carries the heat vapor of low viscosity solvent like a kerosene with sufficiently high flash point instead of air. So once the vacuum is done, 
the heating cycle starts slowly. It's important slowly. I said that purposely. Because if we start the heating cycle fast to save time, then the similar bubbling effect that you see on your insulation will be will happen. And also your moisture will come out from the insulation so quick and it's not acceptable for the quality of the insulation. So heating cycle starts, kerosene spraying, and then the system actually sucks this kerosene out. What happens is when you spray this kerosene with the heat in it and vacuum, it actually dissipates the heat everywhere within in that picture that you say you saw earlier. I said there's low voltage coil in there. There are blocks underneath and above. It pretty much allows the heat to dissipate everywhere inside that vessel, inside your core and coils. And we have different recipes. What's a recipe? It's a cycle. How many cycles of this heat kerosene cycling is going to go through? Depend what how do you, how do we define the recipes? It's depend on the amount of moisture that 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 core and coil has in it. Because all idea is to go through these uh, cycles and then come down to the fine vacuum time where you finish all your kerosene spraying. You sucked all the moisture, you start again, again, and then you come to a fine vacuum where we monitor, you know, we've been monitoring moisture, we've been monitoring how much water we took out. We have been monitoring all those. Now at the fine vacuum, we have to come down to a point where we, the moisture wasn't, it, it won't, it's, got, it's stabilized now. Okay, once we reach that level, we have acceptable levels. Nobody can actually stop this process until we reach those levels. We say, okay, since we reached all these levels per the recipe, this transformer is dry. Now, you can do this. We have in our factories, very simple machine uh, that's called the moisture analyzer. We actually put uh, press boards, key spacer materials with the transformer in the vapor phase. When the transformer comes out, we say, okay, it's dry, but if somebody says, prove it to me, well, we can say, oh, okay, here's all the readings, but what we can, what we also do is we take that additional key, key spacer that we put in there with the transformer, we immediately vacuum seal it, uh, go to our moisture analyzer and test the moisture content on the insulation. And that's one of the best ways, pokey oaks, that you can do to make sure that your vapor phase drying happen. So we understood the, the, the moisture, where it is, why it, it shouldn't be there. Now we uh, talked about the methods, drying methods, how to get the best drying, uh, how to achieve that in your transformers. I do want to talk about another thing here. Is the drying done on transformers only to remove the moisture? The answer is yes. But is it really just to make sure that it, it works perfectly in the field because you don't have moisture? Yes, and also. In this picture, in this picture right here, when I figure this out, there we go. This is a picture I took in one of our plants where we do isostatic stat, uh, pressing. You don't have to have that for smaller units, medium size, but whatever you do, whichever plant you go, especially these types of coils, discs and helicals, we actually have to dry these coils before we even start assembling them. And we have to apply the pressure, which is called the sizing. Because the idea is, as you know, the mechanical height, of your LVs, your HVs have to be identical. They have to be within two millimeter of each other because these coils are pressed. If we look at, in this picture right here, there is LV, there is RV in there, there's HV in there, and you have two plates that are pressing these trans uh, coils. It is our duty and it's a must that each of these coils, each of these coils are dried and pressed and measured 
to the dimensions given by engineering to ensure that we are within those dimensions so that when we assemble them together like this, yes, they're going to go back in the vapor phase. Yes, they're going to get another uh, drying for sure. But you don't want your windings to be at different heights or you don't want to assume that the winding heights are going to be okay. It may not. Imagine what happens if there's an LV in that. And if the LV is, say, uh, one-eighth of an inch or quarter of an inch shorter in total mechanical height than your HV, then what's going to happen is all that pressure that we apply through the pressure rings, which is calculated by the short circuits and clampings that adds those LVs and HVs and all that, it's going to just sit on your HV. It may crush your HV winding, and then your LV winding is going to be sitting there all loose. So that's another drying process that we do in our transformer factories. Everybody does. See, I'm still trying to figure. There we go. You know, this is isostatic pressing, but it doesn't have to be. But regardless of what, every coil must be dried and sized before they get landed on the core steel. In conclusion. There is correlation between the amount of water in the oil and the paper. However, this correlation is dynamic and is changing as a function of temperature. The dynamics of the distribution of water in the transformer is quite complex. The relative saturation levels rather than the parts per million level should be used for assessments. Thank you so much. As I said before, uh, you're going to receive a poll now. Please, if you could answer that, it's really very quick, one click. Uh, and then we are going to be ready uh, for Q&A in just a minute. And by the way, here is the email, marketing. Uh, I'm going to say the email, marketing at vatransformer.com. Uh, for your continuous education credits, please uh, email to that, and Corey will be happy to email you your certificates and the material. Okay, uh, Andrew, I think we can go back to the video. Okay, thank you. So here, here is the email, marketing at vatransformer.com. And uh, if you want to, you're very welcome to email me as well, which I will write my email here. It is hakan.sahin at gatransformer.com. Dot com and I will be happy to uh, answer any additional questions you may not want to ask here or you may want us to do this webinar again for your colleagues or anybody else. So, Corey, do we have any questions? We do. Uh, I feel like some of them may have kind of been answered, but I'll read them to you anyway. Okay. Um, can you talk about pros versus cons of different drying methods, vapor phase, conventional, et cetera? I believe I answered that already uh, as I went through the slides. And the next one is, can you could you talk about the methodology for determining how dry transformer is dew point versus moisture content? Uh, uh, good question. The dew point is uh, is a is a method used when you receive the transformer without oil in them. Uh, Imagine if we are going to ship your transformer, it's heavy and oil has to be drained and we have to uh, put uh, super dry air in them and you do the dew point measurements when you receive it. We do it here before we ship it as well, of course. Uh, it pretty much gives you an idea of the general dryness of the transformer. However, it will not tell you exactly if every insulation material is has been dried properly. Uh, but it is a general indication of if your dry air was good, if there was any exposure during shipment, uh, yes, it will give you that. But it is really for those purposes. What I will do, <clears throat> I will receive it, do my dew point, 
say, okay, dew point looks good, it's acceptable, and then I will do my oil filling and everything else in the field and then take my moisture a couple days after, uh, maybe a day uh, after oil, vacuum oil filling the transformer. All right. Will keeping the cellulose in oil have an effect on how quickly the cellulose chains break down? Or will, will it speed up or slow down cellulose degrade? Degradation? Keeping, what was the beginning of the group? Will keeping the cellulose in oil have an effect on how quickly the cellulose chains break down? Keeping the cellulose in oil help the cellulose break down? And I said, is that, will it speed up or slow down cellulose degradation? Maybe I'm not understanding the question. Cellulose in oil, it's, it's just increasing the strength. I mean, basically, cellulose is all the insulation material that we use in this transformer, including the oil. Uh, there are some other materials, but cellulosic material, as I said earlier during my presentation, why we choose to use the cellulosic material is because cellulosic material soaks the oil in and uh, the, the, the dielectric strength uh, increases via that. Uh, unfortunately, like I said before, during that one of those slides, uh, it is, uh, even to, to, to this date, is to be the best insulator used in liquid fuel transformers. Have you had experience with online drawing systems, both permanently installed or portable units? Online mm -hmm. drawing systems? Uh, the only online I can think about, I mean, you for drawing a transformer, you have to have a cube. Uh, having heard the word online, I'm guess, uh, guessing here that it's a field drying. Uh, otherwise, if I think about our plants, we can see our vapor phase data. We can log into it and see from our homes. But the online drying, I've never heard about an online drying. Because to dry a transformer, you got to have heaters. you got to have... Uh, degasifiers, you got to have big, big equipment, but some of them may have PLCs and you may see the results online somewhere, but there is nothing that I know of called online drying. Is there a to dry? To dry? Yes, of course. Like that uh, in one slide, you saw uh, the, the paper wrapping around that conductor has been too dry and it was brittle. Yes, absolutely. You're, you're going to have to have some moisture uh, in your in your insulation. Absolutely. And the other effect, uh, I did not talk about that, but since I, we are talking about that now, I, I said that as transformers run in the field, they age, moisture leaves. The, what happens when something leaves an area? Moisture comes out of the insulation, the size of that insulation shrinks. So if your transformer was not manufactured properly, and if it was wet, and the moisture eventually comes out over time, the thickness of your insulation, it can be your key space, it can be your blocks, they are going to shrink. So some of you in this webinar might have heard that the transformer is loose after so many years in service. Why are they loose? Why don't we have that clamping on it as, as it was when we shipped it? Because the insulation dried, and now your pressure is not, and your windings are loose. And so that actually you may have a mechanical failure against faults because of wetness too, or after over drying over time from moisture leaving the insulation. Online drying is extensively used all over the world. Heat and vacuum are not the only options as they continuously remove the DGA profile. There are many absorption-based systems available. Okay, that's great. I mean, I know about online DGA monitoring systems. I never heard about an online drying. I'll be happy uh, if uh, whoever that customer or attendee, if you can email me. You still have to have equipment. Right, you got to have heaters and everything else. Some something has to get vacuum, heat, and degassing. But yeah, if if you can please email me, uh, I would love to learn how to do online drying.
I hope you are not talking about online DJ monitoring. That's a different thing. As of right now, that's all the questions that we have. What a great timing. It's 4 p.m. Uh, as I said before, uh, please email to marketing.com. Market, excuse me, marketing at vatransformer.com. Or you can email me for any further questions, hakan.sahinajtransformer.com. Uh, once again, thank you so much. I hope we did okay. This was our first time doing this live. Uh, if it wasn't okay, we will make it better. But thank you so much for attending today. Have a good day.